Ennis Enlli, or Bardsey Island, is situated three kilometres off the North Welsh coastline. With a footprint of just 0.7 square miles, yet with a height of 167 metres, the island rises out of the water like a ginormous whale hump, offering sanctuary and breeding grounds to many thousands of seabirds and other wildlife alike. Housing only a lighthouse, a small scattering of dwellings and just a handful of residents, the island has a sense of true remoteness, almost frozen in a time long since past. The main factor that has kept this island remote and elusive is the sea in which it sits. The Bardsey Strait is an extremely energetic stretch of water, experiencing some of the fastest tidal races in the Irish Sea. The Welsh name, Ynys Enlli, translates directly to the island of currents. Even on the calmest of days, the water can be seen churning and boiling as it rushes by at alarming speeds. Any wind or swell quickly exasperate these conditions and mean that the island is often inaccessible. Keen sea swimmers Wynne Rowlands and Natasha Brooks are not put off by the island's reputation and want to achieve a lifelong ambition to be the first people to swim the strait without the aid of a wetsuit, making this the purest crossing possible. To help them safely plan this journey, they approached the School of Ocean Sciences at Bangor University. My name is Dr Sophie Ward. I'm a physical oceanographer at the School of Ocean Sciences, Bangor University. There's a team of us who are ocean modellers. We use models to understand how water flows around the coast. We were approached by two swimmers who had set themselves a challenge of swimming between Unessentially, Bardsey Island and the mainland on the Slim Peninsula across Bardsey Sound, which is an incredibly energetic patch of water. And these two swimmers wanted to better understand the environment, understand what the currents were doing and at what state of the tide it might be best to attempt the swim across the sound. The Bardsey Strait, like all the coastal areas of the British Isles, is affected by the daily tides meaning that the sea level is continually experiencing cycles of rise and fall. During what is called the flooding tide, the Irish Sea pushes into the shore, making the waters along the coastline rise. The level of its maximum height is known as high tide. The waters then turn and are pulled away, this creating what is called the ebbing tide, and the lowest level reached is known as low tide. This process then endlessly repeats, moving between the flooding tide, reaching high tide, then the ebbing tide, reaching low tide, and then back to a flooding tide. But what force creates this huge movement of water? So now to consider some tidal theory and why we actually get high waters and low waters. Around the UK here we have two high waters a day and two low waters a day. And the reasons for that, the main driving reason for that is the moon. So here we have the moon and the earth, and then we'll come on to how the sun affects the tide as well around here. What we have is the moon rotating around the earth. And where the moon, the moon creates this gravitational pull. So it's pulling the water on the earth towards it. But also the earth is spinning on its axis. And this spinning creates a centrifugal force which creates an opposite bulge of water, opposite to the bulge which is towards the moon. So that's spinning around, and then we have the moon spinning around the Earth as well. And the Earth spins within those two bulges, and it spins once a day. So every day it goes through the high tide bulge, and then six hours later it rotates within that low water bulge. Again, six hours later, it will be within the high water bulge. And then as it spins around, six hours later, we'll have another low water. So then we'll bring the sun into our 
earth moon system um, with respect to the tides so we have our rotating moon around the earth and that whole system rotates around the sun now when the sun and the moon are in line the sun is also exerting a gravitational pull on the earth's water and the moon is pulling the earth's water and what it does is increases that bulge so we get a really high bulge which means that we have a really high high water which is what we call the spring tide. Now when the sun and the moon are out of line, we have what's called a neap tide. So the high waters are not as high as they are on a spring tide because the gravitational pull is not working together. And here again, when the sun and the moon are on the opposite sides, we have another spring tide. And then again, a week later, and we have another neap tide. And again, when we go round, there's a week between each of these cycles and that's our month, that's our lunar cycle, and it exhibits a spring, neap, spring, neap, and then back to spring a month later. So the tidal currents are created by the water rushing into and out of these bulges. So here when we have spring tides, we have a really strong gravitational pull, we have a big bulge, high waters, the really high tidal currents rushing into and out of these in comparison to when they're in neap tides. So here the gravitational pull from the moon and the sun is not as strong and the bulges are a lot smaller than they are up here and the currents are a lot lower and actually that would be a much better time for the swimmers to do their swim when the currents are lower than they are at spring tide. But why are the currents of the Bardsey Strait particularly intense? This is because of a restriction to the movement of tidal water. As the flooding tide pushes northward in the open sea, it meets the obstruction of Bardsey Island. The water then finds a way past by being forced in and through the narrow channel of the Bardsey Strait. This constriction forces the water to flow faster, creating the treacherous currents. The same phenomenon happens in the opposite direction with the ebbing tide. At different states of the tide, the currents flow at different speeds, as shown here by Dr Ward. What we can see here are some outputs from a model, so an ocean model of Bardsey Sound, and the arrows are indicating the current flow, so the longer arrows indicate really fast tidal currents and the shorter arrows are the smaller tidal currents and you can also see the direction with the arrow so there the tide is flooding southeast and it's ebbing it's on the decreasing tide out of Barsi Sound and just there it's, the tide is turning around and the arrows have turned around and now are facing northwest they're heading northwest which means that the tide is now flooding we're on the increasing tide the time towards high water through Bardsey Sound and when you see the arrows stop and turn around that's the turn of the tide and interestingly in Bardsey Sound the turn of the tide takes longer turning from low tide to high tide so on the turn of the ebb tide the period of slack water and low tidal currents are much longer on the turn of the ebb tide than on the turn of the flood tide, which is actually really important for these swimmers. So ideally what they will do is set off just before the low tide and the turn of the ebb tide and they'll have a longer period of low currents in order to swim across the sound. Not only are the computer models really helpful for helping us decide the best time to set off, but they can also help us to decide the best route to take because these strong tidal currents in Bardsey Sound are actually going to push our swimmers off course. So they want to swim the shortest possible route from Bardsey, Sound, Bardsey Island to the mainland. Um, but if they just take the, the shortest route on a straight line, all the currents are going to do is push them off route. Basically what the problem is, is we have Essentially, the island, and we have the mainland that the swimmers want to get to, and the distance here is about three kilometres, so we have 3,000 metres. And what we have is this, if the swimmers tried to swim the shortest trajectory, but the tidal currents were coming down here, the swimmers would just be pushed off course down there. So we can use simple trigonometry to calculate the problem. 
So say we had a current speed of half a metre a second, 0.5 metres a second, pushing the swimmer through the channel in that direction. Say the swim took an hour, we could calculate how far the distance that that would push the swimmer south and actually off course. If the swimmer set off in that trajectory, it'd be pushed that far in an hour by a 0.5 metres a second current by 1800 metres. So that swimmer would be pushed off course by that much. So actually what we want is the swimmer to leave this point here at a trajectory in this direction and then over the course of the swim and the hour what would happen is they'd be pushed south by this current and hit landfall in our planned area. So we can actually use simple trigonometry to help us calculate that angle at which the swimmer ought to set off. We have the triangle that we want, so that's the distance across the channel. And that's the 1800 metres that they've been pushed in the wrong direction, that they would be pushed in that time. And that's the swimmer's course, that's the way the swimmer wants to swim, to be pushed that way. It's 3000 metres across the channel. So we can calculate theta by using trigonometry. This is the opposite and this is the adjacent. So we have tan of theta equals the opposite over the adjacent, which is our 1800 metres over 3000 metres. And that will give us our angle that the swimmers ought to set off at in order to reach landfall at the point that they want. With all this information, a suitable date and time can be chosen for the swimmer's crossing. We need a day when the sea is warm and the winds are light for safety and ease of swimming. We cannot predict the weather far into the future, but we can use historical records to understand the climate. Using a 40-year record, we can make the best guess of the date when the water is warmest, the weather is calm and there is a small, neap tide and what time to start the swim to ensure the currents are low enough to cross the strait. The big day has arrived and so far the predictions are proving correct. The weather is warm and settled and as a result the seas are clear and calm. This swim is extremely dangerous and should only be attempted by experienced sea swimmers with the right planning and support crew. Wynne and Natasha set off just before slack water to ensure they can swim as much of the channel before the currents start to flood through. Will they make it across in time or will they be swept out to sea? winds battle continues. The currents are now racing through the channel, strengthening by the minute. Wind has been swimming for nearly two and a half hours and will be suffering the effects of hypothermia. 
Although Wynn is now very close to the mainland, it is evident that it is impossible to fight the currents at this stage of the tide. To save being swept out to sea, Wynne will have to end his attempt here and climb into the safety boat.